Welcome to the Archimedes stage. Um, so we have a special announcement. We now have uh, John Maddock Hall, uh, and he'll be speaking about the history of computers and how things came about. So big round of applause for John Maddock Hall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm one of the people who helped to plan Campus Party here, particularly for free and open source software. And I'm particularly happy to be here in England, in London, because there's a lot of computer history that happened right around this area. A lot of people are not aware of that. They're not aware of the contributions that England and the rest of Europe made to computer systems. Most people think that computers were invented in Silicon Valley or Redmond, Washington, but it's simply not true. So this talk is a little bit about that. First of all, who am I? I started off being an electrical engineer in 1969. After being electrocuted by 13,600 volts and 800 amps, I decided to go into software. And I started to figure out about these wonderful things called computers that by just using pure logic, you could create and solve problems. This was even better than drugs. And let me tell you something, in 1969, that was quite something. Now, 1969 was an interesting year because that was the year that Unix was born. It was also the last year that I shaved. And since that time, I've been working on mainframes, Unix since 1980, and Linux since 1994, when I first met Linux Torvalds. I've worked on very large systems and very small systems. I've been a programmer, a systems administrator, a producer of software, and a consumer of software. Now, I'm going to warn you that this talk is a highly opinionated talk, and that, you know, a lot of substance can hear. We can argue about things over beers later as to how things happen, but most of this is based on true history. We're going to have a definition of terms, what terms are that we're talking about, and this is interesting because of what is a computer, really, then a quick history of the computers, and then the technology in the emerging marketplace. So definition of terms, a CPU is basically made up of registers, a sequencer, and a controller, an arithmetic logic unit, which determines what the CPU does. It controls things. There's also a main store, which uh, originally in times were made up of different types of parts, but later on became either core memory or semiconductor RAM memory. There's some type of a bus that exchanges information between these different parts. You could do I.O. And finally, in some computer systems, there's an operating system with a kernel and a distribution around it. Now I'm going to go way back in time to some of the first programmable machines. The music box was one of the first programmable machines. You had a comb of, of metal that you would have a, a cylinder on it with, with pins sticking out, and that the cylinder would turn and play the pins and make the music. This is automated music. Now, the real pro first programmable machine that used anything like punch cards was a Chicard loom. In 1801, there was a loom that would weave cloth. Before that time, you wove the cloth and you printed the pattern on it. The Chicard loom was the first machine that allowed you to weave the pattern into the cloth automatically, following punch cards. The punch cards would be linked together with pieces of tape would go over the top of the machine, and the rods that controlled the pieces of thread would go up and down, either through the hole or not through the hole, and the weave would be done. This was a marvel of the age, and Napoleon actually declared this as being one of the most interesting things that happened in his lifetime. Now, the first computers happened in the period of, 19, of 1791 to 1871. I'm sorry, 1791 to 1871. There was a man named Charles Babbage. And you have to go back in time to understand this. Because just before this, a man named James Watt, here in England, developed something known as the steam engine. This was the first time that you could have power, motive power, to allow things to be manufactured, to allow things, to looms to be made, that you didn't have to have the loom right beside some motive force like water, a water wheel of some type. The steam engine allowed people to have manufacturing plants anywhere you wanted to put it. People became enthralled about this. Machines were going to solve the problems of everybody, 
The machine was going to be the thing that was going to solve all of humans' problems. Charles Babbage was an engineer, and back in those days when you built something, whether it be a bridge or a building, used two basic tools. Used a slide rule to do your calculations, and used a book of tables. Sines, cosines, tangents, all sorts of different tables, all sorts of different formulas. Well, one day, Charles Babbage and a friend of his were sitting there, and they were comparing two books. And they found out that in the same table for the same entry, there were two different numbers. How could this be? Well, you know, they were, books were printed by human beings. The numbers were calculated by human beings. Somebody went out one night, had a few too many beers, and when they came in, they just made a mistake. And they printed the book, and the book had errors in it. And this horrified Charles Babbage. Because what would happen if somebody built a building based on that number, or built a bridge based on that number? The bridge or the building could collapse. And he decided that he was going to create an automated method of printing these books. And so he decided to invent this thing called an analytical engine that could solve these mathematical quantities. But it wasn't enough for the machine to just do the solution. It also had to put and print this in the book so that there was no transcription problem of taking the number that was calculated versus putting it in the book. And so Charles Babbage started to design this. And it was a very, very complex machine. It was a, um, it was a machine that had a lot of parts to it, thousands and thousands of parts. It was a huge machine. And the machining capabilities back at that time weren't as good as they are now. They didn't have a lot of the materials that we had. And Charles Babbage had to collect a lot of money from investors, from the government, to try and make this machine happen. And he, he was halfway through designing it when all of a sudden he had this other bright idea. By using a trick of mathematics called the difference engine, he could actually make the same engine do the same calculations, but with one third of the parts. So he started over again, and he started to create this machine. He got halfway through that, and his machinist decided, hey, I'm giving up on this. So unfortunately, Charles Babbage never finished his machine. Now, there was a very great fan of his named Countess Lovelace. Back in those days, women were not supposed to be mathematicians or anything like that. Men were supposed to stay in the house, take care of the family, maybe play the piano or something, you know, keep the man entertained. That was what a woman's job was. Except, you know, Miss Lovelace, Countess Lovelace didn't quite fit that. She was from a high family. She had gone to university. She had become a, a mathematician. And she believed very much in what Charles Babbage was doing. So she actually wrote programs to, if the machine had been built, that these programs would actually cause the machine to calculate these numbers and to do what Charles Babbage wanted to. So in effect, Countess Lovelace was the first programmer. And in honor of her, we actually named a language later on, Ada, because her name was actually Augusta Ada King, the daughter of Lord Byron, Countess Lady Lovelace. Now, a little bit later, people took what Charles Babbage had done and decided to extend it a little bit, and they actually produced two machines that actually did what he wanted to do. But Charles Babbage himself never saw his machines done. He died penniless and in, in, uh, this, you know, he, uh, just didn't uh, ever see them done. So time moves on. Now, all of this was done here in London. Okay, Charles Babbage was from London, and all of this work was done here. Lady Lovelace was from London. So going on a little bit, it comes to 1935, and there's a guy named Alan Turing who graduated from King's College, and Alan Turing decided to write, uh, design a machine, write a paper about what a thinking machine was like. Now, Alan was actually interested in the human mind, he said, you know, I'm interested in the human mind. The human mind is actually made up of neurons and synapses. Very simple things, but a lot of them. And if this, if this human synapses could come up and solve problems and things like that, why can't we create a machine that will do the same thing? And so he started to write, and, you know, what types of things would this machine do? And he came up with his paper in 1935 
talking about what a machine would do to, in order to solve a solvable problem. Now, there are two types of problems in the world. There are solvable problems and unsolvable problems. What is the last number of pi? What is the last number of e? We don't know. It's unsolvable, okay? But if there's a problem that can be solved, then, and if a machine can solve it, then any machine can solve that problem given enough time and memory. And this is basically the concept of what has become known as the Turing machine. He designed this theoretical machine that could solve any problem given enough time and storage space. And people started to look at this and, and said, yeah, we think that we can actually start to design these machines. Now, this machine, as I said, was hypothetical. He had a linear tape going through that was made up of cells containing symbols. And at each step, the symbol was either written or, or read and representation printed. And the machine would move one square to the left or right as it went along. And there was a change to have a new configuration. But all the mathematical operations could be composed with this machine. Now, at the same time, there's a guy named Konrad Zuse in Germany who is working to create another type of automatic calculating machine. He called it the Zeus One. This was 1936. And he built the first freely programmable computer. Now, when I say computer, this is a thing. It, it can't store its own memory. It's controlled by some type of a tape or some type of input like that. But it was unfortunately very unreliable. And Conrad Zeus kept trying to design more and more of these uh, Zeus machines to make them more and more reliable over time. Claude Shannon, in 1937, decided to create an array of, of relays and switching circuits and tried to build on what has been done by uh, Alan Turing and other people. And again, all of these things are being done in Europe, okay, in England and Europe. Oops, there we go. Now, in 1937, George Stiebitz in Bell Labs started to hear about this stuff, and he started to build a computer also, based on some of this logic. Now we get to some very interesting stuff. There is a place right outside of London called Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park was a place that was trying to decode the German Enigma codes of World War II. Germany was, was taking messages and encoding them using something known as the Enigma machine. The Enigma machine had a series of rotors. The rotors were wired up. You would have a set of seven rotors, any three of which were used at one time. The rotors were positioned in the machine. The rotors were set to a particular position. And then you would type on the keys of the machine and lights on the top of the machine would light up with the encoded message. So if you hit the letter A, perhaps the message on top would come up with the letter Z. And so you would write down that Z. And then the rotors would rotate. And then the next letter you hit was, in effect, using a different code to come up with a different number or a different letter. And it was a very, very simple machine to use. It was very, very effective. To decode the message, you set the rotors to the same position, and you, put, you typed in the letter that you had in the message, and out came the decrypted letter on the top. So like I said, very, very simple to use. It relied on the fact that you had this code book that told you on a particular day what position to put the rotors in and how to set up the machine with the right rotors, and then you could start sending and receiving your messages. And it, this code was very, very, very difficult to break. However, there were some mathematicians over in Poland who had captured one of these machines, analyzed the machine, and started to figure out how you could break this encrypted code. They had actually built a simple machine that could do the decrypting. But by this time, Hitler was coming closer and closer to Poland, and they were afraid that he was going to capture them, find out what they were doing, and then the Germans would change the machine and, and ruin all of their work. So he took the machine to Great Britain, and Great Britain looked at it and said, OK, we're going to make, we're going to finish your work. We're going to go and take this place at Bletchley Park. We're going to turn it into a code decrypting facility. 
and we are going to bring in the best mathematicians and cryptologists to, to finish your work. And Alan Turing was one of them. Alan Turing created, designed, what has no, become known as a bomba. It actually is a, a model of the Polish machine, except it could start to decrypt the messages in parallel. Instead of just using one bomba to decrypt a message, it would actually break up the message and start to do multiple paths through this decryption. The other thing that Alan Turing contributed to this was the fact he found out that at a certain point of going through, you could actually prove that the rest of the path was useless. So instead of continuing down that path and wasting time, he would have the Bamba stop, select a different path to go through the decryption, and therefore cut the decryption time considerably. So these are the contributions that Alan Turing made to creating the Bamba. Now, over time, Great Britain got so good at doing this that from time to time they actually faked their messages. They would actually fake, uh, they, would, they would decrypt the message, they'd find out what the Germans were doing, and they would ignore it. So the Germans figured out, oh, if they, if they had broken our code, they would have stopped us over here. They didn't do it, so they must not have broken it yet. Or there was one time they took a dead British officer, they stuffed messages in his pocket, threw him overboard on the ship, let him drift ashore, let the Germans find him, and from the messages in his pocket, the Germans said, oh, the British have no idea what we're doing. Couldn't possibly have broken the code because all the messages in this dead body are pointing to the wrong things. And they never figured out that the British actually planted the body specifically to fool them. But over time, they did upgrade the machine. They put in more rotors, and they used this machine called the Lorenz machine to send the highest level of messages between the highest level of the Germans. And this machine was so, the messages were so complex that the regular Bombas could no longer uh, decode them. And so they created this second machine called Colossus. It was designed by a guy named Max Newman and another man named Tommy Flowers. It was based out of tubes and relays taken from telephone gear. And the reason they were using standard materials was they didn't want the Germans to say, oh, what are these guys doing here? Why are they, why are they, why are they ordering this type of stuff to be done? By using standard telephone parts to build this, they escaped notice of building this machine. This machine was about 10,000 times faster than the Bamba at being able to solve these problems. And after a while, the British built about 30 of these Colossus computers to do this. In the same time, in Germany, Konrad Zuse had gotten up to the Z3. This used binary arithmetic. Some of the early computers used decimal arithmetic, but binary arithmetic was a lot more dependable. He also had a floating point unit that could do floating point arithmetic instead of just integer arithmetic. It was a machine that was electromechanical and it could be considered to be Turing complete. In other words, it could store its own program in its own memory. Unfortunately, it didn't quite get put together. In 1942, John Anasoff and Clifford Berry created a computer called the ABC computer. It too was binary, it too was electronic, but it was not programmable, it was single purpose, and therefore it wasn't Turing complete. In 1944, Tommy Flowers built a second Colossus, but again, it was still not Turing complete. It used a tape to program it. In, 1990, in 1944, in Harvard, in the United States, a man named Howard Aiken developed the Mark I computer. This computer was a decimal computer and it was electromechanical. It actually had a drive shaft that went up the base of the computer, and that shaft turned three times every second. So its cycle time was 333 milliseconds. The machine sounded a little bit like a car crash when it was running, and it was used to, uh, to calculate ordinance. Now I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. 
How many of you have seen movies of old World War II movies, you know, where people are firing the big guns, you know? Well, let me tell you what was happening there. First of all, you have a bunch of grunts. People were 17, 18 years old, probably did not go to university. They volunteered for the war because, you know, Hitler was, was going to attack people and stuff and everything was going to come to an end. They're volunteering for this war, but they aren't exceptionally intelligent, okay? They're up there on the front lines. They don't know too much about mathematics or anything like that, but here you've got this really big gun. It has this really big shell. You're going to be shooting this shell a long way up there, okay? It's going to be up in the air a long time. Well, if it's up in the air a long time, the wind is blowing the shell, okay? So what you need to do is you need to turn the gun the opposite way, against the wind. This is known as windage, all right? You see the enemies a long way off. Well, if you shot the gun straight up, the bullet goes straight up and comes straight down and hits you. If you aim the gun parallel to the ground, the bull will go ching, boom, you know, and blow up there. So you have to angle the gun at a, certain, at a certain angle. What angle you angle it at also depends on how much powder you use. And the powder comes in certain fixed quantities. You have a 10-pound bag, a 5-pound bag, a 1-pound bag of gunpowder, okay? You don't have a half-pound bag, sorry. So you have to do all your calculations with the weight of the shell, the length of the distance, where is the enemy? Is the enemy above you or below you? What is the wind? All this type of stuff. And you're the grunt. So you have this thing called a field telephone. I'm sure you've seen them in the movies. This person sitting there with the field telephone calling something. What he's calling is this place in Princeton, New Jersey, with a bunch of women sitting there with calculating machines, and these books are filled with tables like Charles Babbage had, filled with calculations and stuff like that, and they're just calculating as fast as they can that the enemy is this distance, this height, you know, the wind is blowing this fast from this angle, and, you know, how much gunpowder you should use, how many elevation, windage, fire the gun. Then they sit there with binoculars. You've seen this too, binoculars. And all of a sudden, they see that the bullet hits like 250 feet to the west. Okay, this is a problem. And it's a special problem because the enemy also has a big gun. And since you just shot, the enemy knows where you are. And the enemy isn't stupid. The enemy starts moving their gun. And if you're smart, you start moving your gun. And the wind is changing, and the sun is going down, and the, and the birds are flying overhead and shitting on your shell. And all this stuff is happening, okay? All this stuff is changing. And you're calling on all this information, and these women are cranking these things. And Howard Aitken said, if I can create a fast calculating machine and program it with all these ordnance information that these guys can call this in, gave me distance, wind speed stuff, and I can have the answer like that, and they can fire it, and they'll hit, hopefully. And if they don't hit, then a fraction of a second, I can give them another calculation, and they can try again. And so he created the Mark I. Howard Aiken was a commander in the United States Navy, and he was an electrical engineer. And he was also a male chauvinist pig. And when he got all finished, they said, oh, great job, Howard. Now program it for ordinance. Yes, I can't do that. Because I don't know anything about ordinance. I'm an electrical engineer. I designed a computer. I have no idea what ordinance is. So they sent down to, uh, to Princeton, New Jersey, and they brought up one of these people. And they said, could you program this computer with ordinance? And this person's name was Grace Murray Hopper. And Grace Murray Hopper, when, when Howard Aiken heard that Grace Murray Hopper was coming up, he said, I don't want a woman on my team. You know, I'm, we're men. We're in the Navy. I don't want a woman on my team. Unfortunately for Howard, he had to leave. He was called away to another meeting. And he was gone for about two weeks. And in that two-week period of time, Grace Murray Hopper came up, taught herself how the computer worked, taught herself how to program it, programmed the computer, and whipped Howard Aiken's team into shape. So much so that when Howard Aiken came back, he had to admit that Grace Murray Hopper was more of a man than he was. <laughs> and so Grace Murray Hopper is the first modern computer programmer. Going back to Zeus again, he started again in 1945, another Turing complete machine, binary, but because this was Germany, nobody was going to recognize his work. 
And so he kind of faded into obscurity. In 1946, the ENIAC was created at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. In 1969, when I was a university student, I was taught that the ENIAC was the first electronic digital computer. Why? Because at the end of World War II, Winston Churchill declared that all of the Colossus machines be destroyed, all of the Bomba machines be destroyed. He was afraid that if World War II started up again, and if the Germans knew that they had broken the Enigma code, that the Germans would have made a code that was unbreakable. And because he didn't want to take that chance, he swore every single one of the 30,000 people who worked on that project to secrecy forever. Well, forever lasted until 1970, when the, war, when the war information was declassified. And in 1970, people started to find out about Bletchley Park and the work that was done there. And one of the great stories about Bletchley Park was when they opened it up and people started to come there, there was this old couple, man and woman, had been married ever since the end of World War II. And they were standing there looking at the park, and the, and the guy says, yeah, that's where I used to work, right over there. And she said, oh, really? Well, that's where I used to work, right over there. They've been married for over 25 years and had never once mentioned to each other what they had done during the war. So, there were other machines, electromechanical machines, but they were not either stored program, nor were they electronic, and things went on. Now, in June of 1948, in Manchester, England, Alan Turing wanted to create a small-scale, Turing-complete computer system called Baby. And they wanted to store the data in a cathode ray tube memory. So in the cathode ray tube, what you did was you could write with a, with a beam, and the phosphorus would start to glow, and you'd go back and read it again with the glass, if the phosphorus was glowing. So the scan rate was going across. It was kind of a serial direct access memory, okay? And if you wanted to erase memory, you had to erase the whole vacuum tube. So you had the whole cathode tube. So you had to have some place to store the data while you erased the long-term memory. Kind of crude and primitive. But Turing wrote another paper in 1948 about intelligent machinery. He said, what would happen if I could talk to a machine and the machine could answer back to me? And I had no way of figuring out whether this is a machine or not. Would this be an intelligent machine? No matter how I put it together, no matter what it's made up of, but if I can't tell that who I'm talking to is a machine or not, that that machine must be intelligent. And there was a lot more to the paper, but this became a measure of artificial intelligence which exists to the day. And this is why Watson, in you know, the IBM machine Watson, when it was playing against other players, was so fascinating. Because in effect, it, you couldn't tell that Watson was not a human being. Now, at the University of Cambridge, Cambridge, England, in 1949, Maurice Wilkes, who was actually a classmate of, Marie, of uh, Alan Turing, they both graduated from King's College in the same year, uh, Maurice Wilkes was the head of the EDSAC project, and the EDSAC project was the first computer system that completed the Turing model. It did stored program, it did all the calculations necessary to complete the Turing model. And it used mercury tubes to store the data. So you had a long tube of mercury, and you had a transducer in one end that created a pulse of sound. The pulse of sound would travel up the tube of mercury. When it got up to the top, there was a transducer that could figure out whether there was a pulse there or not. If you wanted to do a non-destructive read, you had to duplicate that pulse electronically back at the bottom of the tube, and it would travel up the tube again. If you had eight tubes, you could have a byte of memory. But once again, there was a serial time 
that it took for that vibration to go through the tube. And so it's kind of a direct access, but yet still credential access memory. But it worked until the truck came by and vibrated everything. Now, 1950, Turing wrote another uh, paper, and this time it was published in Machinery Intelligence, a magazine, in Mind, a magazine. And this was the formalization of the Turing test of intelligence. And he described a state machine very clearly in this message. Now again, the people who did some of the first programming of these machines, because these machines were done during wartime, and most of these machines were aimed at some, some aspect of, of war, whether it be decoding messages, doing ballistics, or calculations of different types. These women, these people were mostly women, not all of them, but a lot of them were women, a lot of them in the military. And up until this time, these machines had names like electromechanical numerical calculator or something like that. But these women had an official designation in the Navy wave category. Because what they did was they calculated ballistics. They computed ballistics. Their official term in the US Navy was computers. And after this, after a while, the, the machine took on the name of the person. And that's why we call them computers. Now, about this time, people started to say, maybe we can take and develop companies out of this. IBM had been in the industry for a very long time using tabulating machines with cards, Hollerith cards, made, with Herman, made by Herman Hollerith, helping with the 1890 census of the United States. But IBM decided they were going to step in and start making some of these newfangled things called computers. Famously, Tom Watson, the head of IBM, figured we'd only need five computers in the world because that's all we would need to do all of the computing necessary for humankind. I'm kind of glad he was wrong. Burroughs, another company, Univax Berry, all of these companies, a lot of whom don't exist anymore today, or some of them exist, but they've gone off into different areas. And finally, the company that I worked for, Digital Equipment Corporation. Now, I'd also like to take some time to point out a myth. A lot of people think that back in these days, computer vendors like digital, like IBM, created different operating systems to lock their customers in. That you would write your program for the operating system, and we would make our operating system different from a, a competitor's operating system, so that you'd be forced to use our computer. Believe me, folks, I was there. That conversation never came up. Because you've got to remember that these computer systems typically had memories of 4,000 12-bit words of memory. The first computer I ever worked on had only 4,000 16-bit words of memory. There wasn't any room for an operating system, OK? I wrote my program. And I linked the device drivers into my program, and I booted my program to run inside the machine. And one program at a time ran inside that machine, OK? It, in, those, in that time frame, IBM mainframes would have a quarter of a megabyte of memory. And the operating systems there were very simple. And we created operating systems to allow our customers to use the machine more efficiently. That's why we had it. So at one time, we created this machine called the PDP-11. It had a 65K address space. It was a mini computer. We had 11 different operating systems on that machine. One operating system was RT-11. It did real-time work. Another operating system was RSX-11. It did soft real-time and time-sharing work. Another system was RS... RS um, RSTS, a, a time-sharing system used for education. Its main programming language was Basic Plus. We had Unix systems, two or three different types of Unix systems, System 3, System 5, Berkeley on this. If we were trying to lock people, we had 11 different operating systems on the PDP-11 architecture. If we wanted to simply lock people in, we could have done it with one. 
And we would save a lot of money than having the 11. But we were trying to create interfaces to allow people to run batch jobs or time sharing or real time and do it efficiently. This is also the time where there were no computer science degrees. If you were doing computer science, it's because you were a physicist, or because you were an electrical engineer, or because you were a weather forecaster, or because you were a chemist. You had a real job of doing that work, and you wrote programs to solve your own problems. I had a professor of mine in 1969 turn to me and say, John, you're never going to ever make a, a living as a professional programmer. And I'm still trying to find out if he was right. Okay. You know, it's only later on that the concept of professional programmer, somebody who wrote programs for somebody else, came about. And in 1969, I was, I was a college student. I couldn't afford $100,000 for compiler. And so I joined this organization called DECUS. And we'll hear more about DECUS in a couple minutes. Also in 1969, in New Jersey, there was a guy named Ken Thompson. Ken Thompson was a researcher. He was assigned to a project called Multix. It was a group project of the telephone company, MIT, General Electric, and a bunch of other people trying to des design an operating system that would be the be-all, end-all operating system for everybody. Unfortunately, at that time, the telephone company was being inspected by the government and said, we think you're a monopoly. And being a monopoly and being a telephone company, you can't be involved with computers because obviously computers have nothing to do with telephony. So they pulled Ken Thompson back from this project. Ken went back to the labs in New Jersey. He was disappointed because he loved working on computer systems. He found this cast-off computer system in the hallway called a PDP-7. And he joined with a few other people to write this tiny little operating system that was going to be one thing for one person, Unix. And Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie wrote the first Unix system. Let me describe how that was done, because the PDP-7 had a memory that was too small to fit much in. So they had to go to another computer system and write the assembly language for the PDP-7 and have a cross assembler punch it onto paper tape and bring it over to the PDP-7 and load it in and watch it fail. Then go back to the original computer, type in some more machine language, punch out the tape, bring it over to the PDP-7 and put it in and watch it fail. Okay. Fortunately, Ken and Dennis are really good programmers, so watching it fail didn't happen too often until they had something that would actually run. And this started to gain the attention of other people in Bell Labs. Now, they need, the, the PDP-7 was running out of steam. So they needed another computer system. But unlike the PDP-7 that was cast off in the hallway, nobody was using it, the PDP-11 cost $150,000, which they didn't have to do this. So they went to the one place inside of Bell Laboratories that had all the money in the world and never had to justify anything to anybody. Can anybody figure out what that, what that place was? Where in Bell Labs had all the money in the world? What? Military, no. This is Bell Laboratories Research Division. Not banking, but you're getting close. No, no, the CEO didn't have any money. What? You're getting really, really close. The legal department. <laughs> this is Bell Laboratories, and they were writing all these patents and stuff and filing these patents and stuff like that. This is how you know, Bell Labs made a lot of money was by developing things and then patenting it and licensing these patents out to people. And the patent department had money. Okay? And Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie convinced the lawyers, that they would write a computer system for them so they could type in their legal briefs and format them and print them out and they would look beautiful. Now, I want to, I want to remind you that this is being done with not a full screen editor, not a line editor, but a dot editor, ED. It's also being done with NROF and TROF. 
Imagine a lawyer sitting there, typing in their legal briefs, formatting it with NROF and TROF. No. That's why we developed some really intelligent people called legal secretaries. <laughs> and they would actually do the formatting and stuff. It's also one of the reasons why Unix is so character-oriented with its, with its pipes and filters. By the way, the person who invented pipes and filters was a man named Douglas McElroy. Dennis was the head of Bell Laboratories, the, the, the department that hired Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Ken, uh, Dennis, uh, yeah. Doug is also credited with coming up with the concept of macros. So he's a very intelligent guy. They took their program that was written in assembly language for the PDP-7, and they rewrote it into assembly language for the PDP-11. So this is the second time they've written a kernel in assembly language. And then after that, Dennis says, this is too much work. I'm going to create this language called C, and we're going to rewrite the kernel in that. So they rewrote the kernel again in C. And they said, Phew, thank God we're finished with that. No, it didn't help them, because then they were moving from the PDP-11 to an interdata 832, and they found out that there was huge architectural differences. So they rewrote the kernel again by separating the device-independent parts of the kernel from the device-dependent parts of the kernel. And the more different places they pointed it, the, the better and better they got at separating the parts of the kernel that were device-independent, like scheduling, memory management, things like that, from the parts that were device-dependent, bus structure, I.O., types of things like that. And they kept doing this and doing this. Also in 1969, the ARPANET was created. The thing which we now call the Internet, the ARPANET was created. But nobody believed at that time we would have all these computer systems tied together, multi-billions of them. That's why the address space for the Ar ARPANET was only 15 bits. Because we figured, you know, just like Tom Watson said, we only need five computers in the world. ARPANET says, hey, we only need to hook together about you know, 1,024 systems. Wrong. Also in 1969, I was a university student. I started to tell you about that. And the cost of software was really high. There was no shrink wrap software. There were no computer stores. If there had been a computer store, you'd need an 18-wheel tractor trailer truck to haul your computer home. You'd need three-phase electrical power to plug your computer in. You'd need a 20-ton air conditioner to cool it off. And no, the computers were really the same. A company would design a computer. They might produce 100 of them or 1,000 of them. But it wasn't enough to, to sustain a binary-only distribution. A compiler might cost you $100,000 a copy. That's a lot of money, isn't it? But if your computer system costs you $2.5 million, and this compiler is going to make your programs run 10% faster, that's like saving $250,000. So a $100,000 computer is, is, compiler is a good deal. And when you ordered the compiler, the magnetic tape showed up with the compiler on it, with the source code of the compiler on it. But you also got an engineer. And he spent about a week there getting his compiler to work on your computer system and feed data in, you know, programs in, and watch the output come out and say, yep, it's working properly, and then he would leave. That's how we did software back in those days. <laughs> but I was a computer. I was a, I was a student. I could afford $100,000 for a computer. So I joined this organization called DECAS the Digital Equipment Corporation Uses Society. There was another one for IBM called Share. There's another one for Novell called Brainstorm. But they all made up of the same type of people, end users, who were trying to write software to do their own job. And after they got the software written, they said, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to sell it? Well, let me tell you something. Selling, hard, selling software is hard work. You know, people expect documentation. People expect you're going to be fixing bugs. People expect you're going to be able to advertise it, distribute it, things like that. There's all this stuff. And these people were not in the business of writing software. They were physicists and chemists. So they took their software and they contributed it to the Deacus Library. Now, I was a student. I had to pay $15 for the paper catalog of all these programs. And then when I got the paper catalog, I looked into it, the text editor was $5. 
Now, $5 doesn't sound like much today, but $5 back in 1969 would buy you 10 pitchers of beer. You know, and I had a choice, text editor or 10 pitchers of beer. I think you can see what direction I would go. But this was free software. As a matter of fact, software copyrights didn't apply to software at that time. It, software copyrights didn't apply to software until about 1986. Nor did patents. You couldn't patent software. So I would go to the school store. I would buy new paper tape. I would stick it through my ASR 33 teletype. There it is right there. There's the paper tape reader punch. And I would make copies of my text editor. And I would sell it to my, my roommates for a dollar a copy. And by the time I sold 10 copies, I not only had paid for the text editor, paid for the new tape, but I had my 10 pitches of beer. This is the service of creating software. Now, an assembler was $15. That was a real money maker for me. And this is, you know, these people wrote the software and contributed it to Dekas for the same reason that people write free software today. These people would go to Dekas and, and, or people would contact them and say, hey, great piece of software. I made some changes to it. Would you like the changes? Sure. And now you had two people working on your software. You would go to a Dekas meeting and somebody would walk up to you and say, great piece of software. Let me buy you a beer. Or let me buy you dinner. Or would you like a job? And these are all the reasons why people write free software today. So you see, free software is not something new. It's not something that happened because of Richard Stallman. We'll get to Richard in a moment. The PDB-11 had these textual-based commands, sort, awk, red, sep. It's all because those lawyers still were trying to do the legal briefs. And the Unix escaped and went to universities, large government laboratories, stuff like that. And then finally, commercial companies like Digital Equipment Corporation, Sun, started to make binary-only copies of Unix. Why binary-only copies? Because AT&T licensed the source code of Unix for $160,000 per machine. And you had to give them the, the serial number of the computer system you're putting it on. And people say, well, wait a minute, Unix was free, right? No, it wasn't. They licensed it freely to universities. A university could get a site-wide license for $350 and put it on as many machines as they wanted to. But those were research universities. Columbia, Berkeley, you know, MIT, those type of universities. I belonged to Hartford State Technical College. When I wanted to get a copy of Unix, they told me it's $160,000 per copy. And so these companies who wanted to distribute Unix, they said, if we distribute binaries, only copies, can we get it at a much lower cost? And AT&T said, sure. And so that's the reason they were creating the binary-only copies, and yes, to protect their investment, their intellectual property but it was mostly to get around the AT&T licensing. Because we had other ways of protecting intellectual copy, property. We did contracts, contract law, things like that. And that was perfectly good for protecting the intellectual property. Now, Unix had lots of features, very new to various systems, but they were gathering these features from all over, putting them in, time sharing, multi-processing. There were other systems starting to come out, Little computer systems like the Atari, the Kim One, Commodore. They were using some operating systems like CPM, very simple, executive type of system. CPM was for the MIPS Altair machine. It had an S100 bus. You could do 18 and 16-bit uh, computers. The Z80 was a very famous one. 64K memory space. Use 7-bit ASCII. What's great about 7-bit ASCII? You really can only do English with it. Any, any other language like German or Spanish or anything like that, you really need 8-bit ASCII. And so, you know, I can remember engineers in the United States not even understanding the problem <laughs> because they, were only, they only knew English and they never tried to write any type of foreign language with that. 
The Berkeley Unix, when it came out from Berkeley, only supported 7-bit ASCII. Now, back in those days, your storage for these microcomputers were analog cassette tapes. These cassette tapes would, would capture tones, like a modem would make, store those tones on the tape, and when you wanted to play it back, you play the tones back, feed it through the modem again, and create the digital ones and zeros that go in. It was primitive, but it was great. Now, about 1976 and 1977, this company called Apple started up. You may have heard of them. And about the same time, IBM decided it wanted to have a personal computer. And so with Charlie Chaplin at about $20,000, you could have this personal computer sitting on your desk that would have all of maybe 16,000 bytes of memory and use five and a quarter inch floppy disks to store your data. But these things were mostly for professional use. People didn't play games on them. You wouldn't play games on your $20,000 computer, okay? It was much too useful for that. And about the same time, people said, hey, the software is just too expensive, but maybe if we can mass produce the hardware, we can also mass produce the software. And I remember going into the first computer store. There was Apple IIs, there was IBM PCs, and there were three boxes of software on the shelf. Now, you didn't need the operating system. That came with the system. But if you wanted a text editor, it was WordStar. If you wanted a spreadsheet, it was SuperCalc. And then you needed a little modem program to hook your system up to, get, to access a bulletin board to copy down other programs for your system. Those three boxes of software. In 1981, Sun Microsystems and Digital were starting to bring out some of those, and IBM and Hewlett Packard starting to bring out these Unix systems. And there were basically two flavors, AT&T Unix, the right one from AT&T, and BSD Unix. Now, AT&T Unix didn't have really good networking. It was a swapping type of operating system. It, did, it used dial-up store and forward systems called UUCP, Unix to Unix copy, to do its networking. Berkeley Unix was definitely the superior Unix system of the time. So a lot of people bought their license from AT&T, but got their software from the University of California, Berkeley. In 1984, there was a college student at MIT who was used to getting his, the software for Unix in source code form. He liked looking at Unix. He liked seeing how it worked. He liked being able to write little device drivers and things. And now he was getting binary-only code. And this infuriated him. So Richard Stallman started the project which became known as GNU, for GNU is not Unix. It was a project that was going to create a complete operating system available in source code form he started off with something called Emacs. Now, this was actually a brilliant thing, because if he had started trying to write the kernel, he would have ended up finished writing the kernel, but he would have nothing to run on the kernel. It would be useless. Instead, he started writing programs that were portable across a wide variety of different systems. And the first one was a sophisticated text editor called Emacs. A lot of people think he could have stopped with Emacs because Emacs is like an operating system, but he continued on. He ran, he, he created things like uh, suites of compilers, C compiler, Fortran, Pascal, the GNU compiler suite. He created utilities. He created lots and lots of stuff. The, the computer stores started up even more. But there comes this time where you have to balance the technology of the capability versus the cost, the speed of the CPU versus all of the other things that go with it, and also the network capability. And all of these things kept pushing people on to more and more complex systems. Let's talk about standards for a second. I was in a hotel room one time in Korea. I'm in the shower. I'm naked. I know. Too much information. I'm staying there, and the water is extremely hot. My hands are all soaked up, and I'm reaching for the valves, and they're so smooth, I can't turn them off, and I'm being burned. And I'm going, oh, my goodness, why can't this hotel just go down to the hardware store, 
get a new set of knobs with some knobby neurons on them so I can grab them, it'd be easy to replace them because there's a standard for the pipe fittings. But then I thought, what if Apple had designed that hotel? Well, you couldn't replace the handles because th the handles would have been a proprietary standard. You have to replace the pipes in the handles, but you can't replace the pipes because the fittings going to the sewer system is proprietary. You have to replace all the piping all the way out to the street. So standards are good. Ken Olson, the president of my company, once said the standards are as interesting as a Russian truck. What he meant was he hated the process of creating standards because it was nitpicky type of work. He hated doing it. But once the standard was, created, was created as an engineer, he wanted to create something that was faster, better, more scalable, lower cost, more sustainable, more creative. But standards were something you innovated above and below not changing them without consensus. 16% of all computing is the scientific and engineering computing. 84% of all computing is commercial. 500% of all computing is commercial software, consumer software. Standards, the best technology doesn't always win. If you remember Sony Betamax, it was better. But VHS won because it was marketed better. Marketing, good marketing, will often trump good technology. Sony Walkman. We were used to having audio in one place. The Sony Walkman allowed us to carry our audio with us. It was revolutionary. But Sony lost to the clones that came out. Likewise, a lot of companies that had started in computer systems have been lost because of marketing pressures. I'm running out of time, folks. But if I want to leave you with one thought tonight, it's that a lot of computer history happened here and is still happening here. The, the University of Cambridge has developed the Raspberry Pi. The University of Cambridge worked on Zen. ARM is located here in, in London or in Cambridge. There's a lot of stuff that's happening here. And I know that there's a lot of, of effort of people saying, what can we do to make Europe and England centers of technology again? My feeling is it never stopped. And all you have to do is look around, take pride in what you've done and what you are doing and what you will do. Thank you very much. I do have a prize. Alan Turing liked to play the game Monopoly. And Alan Turing changed the Monopoly board to meet his needs. Alan Turing's board was lost for a long time, but they found it in the, in the uh, attic of a building, and it was contributed to Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park worked with Monopoly Company and Google to create a special Alan Turing package of Monopoly. I am going to give this away tonight to the first person who can tell me the name of the first programmer. You got it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mad Dog, for graciously stepping in after Chris Hallman couldn't make it. So thank you very much. Round of applause.